No, no man, no matter how great, can know his destiny. Some lives have been foretold, Merlin. Welcome to Myths and Magic, a fan cast about BBC Smerlin. I'm Edith. And I'm Naomi. And welcome back to a new episode. It's our 10th. Wow. How did yeah, this happen? Yeah, we're in the double digit. <laughs> wow, we haven't crashed and burned yet. I feel like I make the same joke at the start of every podcast, but genuinely iconic that we're keeping this going. <laughs> Truly. Oh, and what a topic. For our oh, yes. first double digit episode. I'm trying to think of another yes. word for 10th, but it's not going very well. <laughs> I don't know what else you could say. Oh, um, 10 is a good number though. Yeah. I'm really excited for today's topic because I was on a super big more Gwen kick, like I think two months ago. And just like, honestly, I, I describe it this way. Like, I would push Merther out of harm's way, but I would take a bullet for more Gwen. And that's just how I feel. (laughs) I feel that. I'm not even sure I would push Merther at this point. (laughs) Like, well, I guess for your equivalent, it's like, you know, you could, you could, you could put Merwain in. Okay. And it's like, okay, thank you. Uh, Anyway, the bullets (laughs) for more Gwen. Anyway, today's topic is more Gwen. (laughs) It is. I mean, I guess it you saw is. that when you clicked the episode, but just to be sure. <laughs> just to reiterate. Well, before we get into the uh, topic that we're going to speak about today, first, thank you again for all your support. Sorry, this episode was a little bit delayed. We actually have kind of an announcement, I guess, regarding this. So I took up way too many classes for school and I have a student job, which is like about six to eight hours a week, which is a lot when, you know, I have classes to that. And um, because editing does take a while and we want to give you the best podcast episode that we can, we've decided for the time being, until (laughs) I'm on break again, that we're going to do one episode a month so that we can give you, I guess, the quality over the quantity and that, you know, I don't die trying to, like, meet any deadlines for myself. So... What will probably happen is, uh, so November, December, and January, definitely one a month. And then we'll see in February, we might go back to two, depending. That's exam time for me. So we'll see. Yeah. I think this is the right choice. I think this is like a fun thing that we do because for some reason we love this weird show. So I think it's (laughs) completely reasonable to maybe cut down on the workload a little bit because it's a lot right now, guys. (laughs) It is. School is uh, killing me, killing Edith. We're dead. <laughs> Uni, huh? Well, enjoying that. Um, otherwise, Edith, how has your week been? Or your, you know, pastime? I mean, it's been busy. But no, it's been fine. It's been a pretty, pretty good week, all in all. It's one of our closest friends. Um her birthday was the day before yesterday, Ooh. so I've had I bought her a gift and she was really happy and it made me happy that she was happy. So, <laughs> wait, how do you say Jung- Jungus Kug or teach me Swedish? Okay, so I don't know if you guys know about the bear that from IKEA, <laughs> but there's like a bear at IKEA and its name is Jungelskog in Swedish. Jungelskog. It literally just means like jungle or like a jungle forest. <laughs> anyway, I bought it for my friend and she was very happy. So <laughs> so we celebrate Sally. We celebrate Jungle's Club. Yes. I've just been really obsessed with High School Musical the last two weeks. It's It's been a real problem. So that's been like my, you know, addiction, my hyperfixation. So that's about <laughs> But, like, if I could summarize my last two weeks, it's, like, school, dying, high school musical, though. So, that is, there we go. Sounds like everything you need in life. I've been obsessed with Hades, which everyone who follows me everywhere will know. But, you know. <sighs> it's like that, yeah. Well, just, again, I guess before this episode, just like we did for the Merther one, 
So the theme is good, bad, and fix it. And just the disclaimer that there will be no ship, like ship bashing. So if that's what you were looking for, you won't find it here. No fic bashing. We're trying to, I mean, not that we have our own biases, obviously, as, <laughs> as I, we opened up this episode with like our bias towards more Gwen, but we're trying to look at the ship from as many angles as we can as possible. And today for the fix it part, we are joined by a very special guest, Alyssa Still Stands. So we're excited to have her on as well. Yes. It's so lovely to have her on. So with that, shall we saunter onwards <laughs> towards the good? We shall. What do you like most about Morgwen, Naomi? Well, Huh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> I'm just like, I don't know if I can explain that so easy. I think I really like, and I guess if we look at seasons one and two um, here, I really like their dynamic and the deep friendship and relationship that they have. And I guess this, this visible care that they have for one another. Like, I really like that connection between Morgana and Gwen. Yeah, I agree. I think I really enjoy the way that Gwen, it's like, I, I feel like their love language is different in a way that is really nice in that Gwen is really good at like the little things and like being there and being supportive while Morgana is like more about the grand gestures and like I'm gonna throw a fit in front of my father and help you in any way that I can uh and I think yeah I just I just like the way that they are together yeah <laughs> I mean that's basically it and I guess if we're talking about their interactions under the sense of good what what do you see like what is their relationship like or like what is their dynamic i think it's it's very much that that gwen is very caring and of course that is her job so we have to take that into account but we're not on the bad yet so i'm gonna ignore it for now um <laughs> I just feel like they care a lot about each other and it's very evident in the first two seasons, I will say, that they just, they're very close and they love each other a lot and you can just see that when they look at each other and it's really cute and I'm, I'm weak. <laughs> <laughs> I think that they also balance each other out very well, um, that their personalities complement each other very well and they kind of you know something that I guess the other maybe I don't know I see it as Morgana maybe you know being a little bit more more headstrong and kind of trying to achieve things she, she seems like very ambitious trying to achieve things no matter what whereas like Gwen you know a little bit more like caring like conscious of the way that she achieves things in her life stuff like that just like this balancing between their personalities i like that a lot yeah yeah i really agree with that i feel like they're because gwen is very chill <laughs> most of the time and she's very she thinks before she does things and i don't think morgana is a person who necessarily does that so yeah it's mm, opposites attract i guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true i i think of many just super good more gwen moments in the show that i'm just like okay um and how are they not together like i remember that one episode i think this is like a fan favorite where gwen you know it's like it literally opens on like gwen walking through through the town and like and showing up um by Morgana to like give her flowers and Morgana's like you cheer me up and it's ah it's I so know. cute like it's just genuinely such a cute scene and I just I don't know I just never got like this like, maybe the way that they smile at each other or the way that the dialogue is said I never got very friendshipy vibes off of that scene I was always like oh <laughs> okay yeah yeah but there's there's something about the way that they look at each other in a lot of scenes where I, I think, because going back and re-watching Morgwen moments from the show, I think Morgwen is one of those ships where I don't necessarily trust myself in remembering it correctly. Because with Martha, 
everyone talks about all of the moments all of the times so I know what I have to work with I know what's there in right. canon and I know how to like if I want to interpret it romantically or not but with more Gwen I always have that and maybe that's because I'm like a queer woman and I want to see representation for myself uh but I feel like in my brain when I think about them I'm like yeah but there's no way they were that gay in canon <laughs> and then I rewatch the scenes and I'm like actually <laughs> I was correct <laughs> this is not me <laughs> this is the show <laughs> I mean it really is just I I feel like the way that they act the way um that Gwen and Morgana act in the first two seasons is just I don't know it's like I just really read a lot of subtext into those moments yeah and like I find that a lot of other people do as well yeah maybe it's just the chemistry between Katie and Angel it's just it just works <laughs> so well yeah and they're just so good yeah oh, love it <laughs> that's true another really um like I guess big more Gwen moment in the show is uh the fact that Gwen comforts Morgana during her nightmares um and we see that well one it's like we see that Gwen um you know she has her own home but when Morgana calls for her in the night she's just there so like you know is she just sometimes chilling in the antechamber just like yeah. in the middle of the night <laughs> that's the um, <laughs> because sometimes like, I'm like it's unclear <laughs> if she sleeps there Morgana or will not. be like screaming and Gwen's like I'm here but I'm like when do you know when to be there I mean, maybe she's there a lot, actually, and she's, like, not really at home all that often. They never really specify that, do they? No. It's whatever's relevant for the plot. That's true. And, I mean, that does beg the question, though, and I will credit this um, to a Discord group I'm in. I had a friend bring this up. It's like, all right, um, why is Merlin, then, not more often in, like, Arthur's antechamber or, like, waiting i don't know like maybe he is maybe we never know <laughs> kind of thing that i mean it was pretty common wasn't it yeah for to be close yeah to have someone by with you at all times i mean yeah. i i would assume that maybe morgana asked her to stay at some like sometimes or maybe not all the time but maybe if she was nervous about the nightmares or something she would ask her to stay on specific nights i don't know because definitely, Maybe, if Morgana, because... if she asked, we all know that Gwen would stay. Of course. Yeah, she wouldn't go. It makes me think in that episode where she sets her room on fire. I can't remember so well right now, but Gwen wasn't there, was she? No, because she had left. So I don't think Gwen... Yeah. I, Gwen probably went home that night. Yeah, because we, being... we do see her walking home at night sometimes, right? That's a thing. Mm -hmm she's not always there of course yeah that's true but uh i just want to bring up the fact that during gwen comforting morgana scenes the face cradling i uh i stand that i think about it <laughs> i am looking I, I i am looking respectfully <laughs> <laughs> oh there's like also this one or is there is this every time she calls for her? I don't know. I'm thinking of one specifically where she's like running towards her and then like gives her like a super big hug or whatever and just like rocking her back and forth in her arms. I'm pretty sure I get, yeah, I think I get that scene. Yeah, there are, mm, there are many good, good hugs. They hug in the moment of truth. I just, I just want us to. Oh, yes. The way we can like just recall more Gwen hugs. It's like take it out of the brain file um, <laughs> for comfort. Honestly, that episode did it turn me gay? Probably. <laughs> I can't believe the moment of truth is responsible. <laughs> Eleven year old me was like, "Wait, they're wearing pants." <laughs> the women it's historically inaccurate. They have question. swords. Wow. <laughs> oh, I understand. Uh, that's also a good, yeah, good episode for like a lot of more Gwen interaction. I find it funny in that episode because it's like, all right, they let more. I mean, like, it's also, I guess, a, a point to their relationship as well and how close they are. But like, you know, more Gwen, obviously, like they share like a bed space. And then you have like the parallel Merther, like sleeping like in like opposite positions <laughs> to each other. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> All right. Good old parallel there. We can obviously see what's the superior ship. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> which one? <laughs> uh, I mean, which one just has the dynamic like together, at least for the time being. Uh, yeah, the time that being. is true. It all yeah. crashes and burns, doesn't it? It does. But, That's for later. <laughs> yeah. Before it crashes and burns, though, we have some good old, good old stuff. And <laughs> one of those things is Morgana standing up to Utha. Yes, I think this just, I mean, I feel like it just, you know, shows the audience that much more how much she cares for Gwen. That Gwen is much more than a servant to her, much more than a serving girl. She cares about, I mean, she cares about Gwen enough, even though she, um, to stand up to Uther, even though she knows the consequences that will follow. I don't think it comes as a surprise to her that Uther treats her so harshly for um, the way that she speaks out against him and she's willing to do that for Gwen. Yeah. Yeah, I mm, I have such a clear image of that scene. Well, two different scenes actually, but the first one when Gwen is kidnapped and she's like, she's more than my servant. Yes. She is my friend. Uh, and I just wanted her to say girlfriend. I mean, yeah, the Lancelot and Guinevere episode, just the way that Morgana kind of mourns the loss of Gwen. Yeah. Um, and just on the other side, the way Gwen is just so willing to do, you know, to let Morgana get away and let herself be captured and everything. I mean, it goes beyond the duties, obviously, of, I mean, just being a servant. I mean, Gwen does it because she she loves Morgana in whatever yeah. capacity that you want to think about it, but... She she cares for Morgana and doesn't ever want to see her get hurt. And I guess, I mean, the, the sentiment is definitely uh, requited. Like, Morgana cares for Gwen and doesn't ever want her to be hurt. So I think it's, for me, a really touching scene when Arthur, you know, brings back Gwen. And he's oh, like, yeah. I have someone here for you. And they're reunited again. I mean, in, in that hug, I think you, you can just see how important they are to each other. And, I mean, how... how much they missed one another and were worried so yeah. i mean just really an s tier scene that is i'm holding back swears right now because i'm feeling a lot of feelings <laughs> <laughs> see that's the danger of a more one episode you just get all like gooey inside and it's yeah. like ah. also a very dramatic instance is of course when morgana tells uther that if he executes Gwen's father. She'll never forgive him. Does that oh, yeah. matter in the long run? Not really. Mm, yeah, I was going to say, mm, not so Uther much. But listen to people? No. Imagine Uther listening to people close to him. Um, I'm not going to go off about Uther right now, but he really loves listening to strangers' advice. He loves that. Oh, yeah. He, he sure does. When his daughter tells him things, uh uh. No go. Uh, but yeah, I think we talked about that as well in the Morgana episode, kind of the impact that Tom's death had on not only Gwen, but her to see, you know, not only Gwen hurting so much, but to see um, this man killed, you know, for, I guess, just kind of participating in like magic. I mean, he himself didn't do any magic, but you know, yeah, um, the injustice and everything. But yeah, can you think of any more specific moments that you just really love? I think th the problem is it's also kind of a limited pick because I will say it's very much season one and two. <laughs> yes, like, and that's, that's what I'm the, thinking. That's the... <laughs> is that when you're thinking about more Gwen moments, it's like, oh, every interaction that they have in season one and two, basically. <laughs> and then after that, it's like, Slim pickings. <laughs> right. I mean, I think there are some touching moments. Uh, well, I guess this kind of goes off of this question, this first question that we have from a listener. Uh, do you want to read it, Edith? And then I'll get into what moment yeah. I was going to talk about. So we have a question from Magic and Fandoms, and they asked... For the more Gwen, I think this is a good and a bad, but when Morgana tells more ghosts that she can trust Gwen when they take over the kingdom, 
In the end, she can't, but there's definitely a period when Morgana thinks Gwen is going to join her. So it's very sad when she doesn't. Um, I guess this just goes really well with what I was going to talk about. Um, I guess another moment that I like is that, although we'll talk about this later, um, their relationship is not acknowledged after a certain point. There is a part right before, um, or right, yeah, right before the kingdom gets taken over for the first time, you know, when Morgana's in allegiance with Morgos in season three, that you can see that she's hopeful that Gwen will stay with her. Now, Gwen at this point has already kind of like her attitude towards Morgana has soured, but just that little, I guess, seed of hope, that little like tiny spark of hope that Morgana has that um, when all this is said and done, that Gwen will still be there with her. I think that's maybe like another good, I guess, story-wise, something I would have definitely liked more throughout things like that. Yeah. Yeah, it it is. And it's also, I guess you could also see it as Morgana, maybe not really understanding Gwen as a person, because Gwen would never betray anyone. And least of all, Camelot. Or like, she, she mm, it's just not something that she would do. <laughs> not even for Morgana, because she's yeah. just, she's not one for those you know just grand gestures of doing what she thinks is right and going against everyone else because she has this vendetta against everything it's mm, it's not really her style is it <laughs> no it's it's really not i think Gwen has like a very strong moral compass as well. And she, you know, obviously starts to recognize the shift in Morgana's attitude and the fact that no matter how much she may love Morgana, the things that Morgana um, is doing just aren't like, it's not right what, what she's doing and how she's doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And that would have been, cause I mean, we've talked about this before. Uh, the fact that their friendship or relationship is doomed to fail is not necessarily that that doesn't mean that it's a bad thing because you know we've talked about this before we love tragedy on this show but oh, the yeah. way <laughs> that the show handled it wasn't great <laughs> mm -mm. so maybe <laughs> it's time to move on to the bad <laughs> oh yes yeah, so I think as we stated before, season one and two, I think portrays their relationship extremely well. And it's a great setup for, I mean, a friendship, a love story, whatever, you know, you may you may want. They're they're extremely close. They care about each other, they love each other. And I think a big problem with this ship or this relationship in general is the way that the show handles this transition. From seasons one and two to um to season three four and five and so edith do you have any i guess initial comments on like the transition in their relationship like why was that bad or how was that bad it's just very abrupt because it very much feels like they were never friends suddenly it's like it's like the show forgets that they had anything other than a like lady and maid relationship like it's because they did because in season one and two they were actual friends like they had such good moments of just genuine friendship i would say um you can you know interpret that as you will but in the later seasons you just get this feeling that the writers either just didn't care about that or they just forgot about it. <laughs> I mean, it's really, how do I put this? It's just really weird. It's in kind of incredible the way that they just made their relationship mean so little. I mean, I get that Morgana at this point at the beginning of season three is coming back um, from a year 
of being, you know, with Morgos. And uh, one of the problems with this time skip, I think, as we mentioned, the Morgana episode is like, we don't have anything to go off what she went through. If she, if she went through some type of like psychological torture, I mean, like, uh, like, it's very obvious she went through some type of manipulation, but it's the audience, we as an audience don't have any evidence to justify the way that Morgana just is so cold to everyone, including Gwen. I mean, even though later in the season, she does, you know, offer kind of that branch to Gwen that she can still join her. Um, she still acts very weird around her. And I mean, just definitely doesn't have like, like doesn't have the same um, love that we saw in earlier seasons. Like Morgana's attitude towards Gwen shifts very, very much. I would yeah. say. And it would have been, I think it would have been different if Morgana had confided in Gwen earlier. If she had told her anything about what was going on, if she had, you know, tried to get her on her side earlier, but she didn't really do that. It wasn't until she had actually like pretty much taken over Camelot <laughs> and then she's like, of course, you'll have a place here. It's right, fine, babe. You, you can stay here as my girlfriend. Ooh. No. Uh <laughs> <laughs> but it's like you know if if when Morgana when she came back I get that she wouldn't tell Gwen everything and especially not right away but with how close they were in season one and two I would think that Morgana trusts Gwen now to be fair Morgos probably told her not to trust anyone but I think it would have made for a much more interesting season and especially a much more interesting character arc for Gwen because we sure need some more to work with there don't we oh yeah because then it becomes this choice where Gwen actually has all the facts from both sides and she has to you know actually make a choice and stuff and that would have been really nice to see I think I think that would have been really good as well it would have brought a lot more meaning, I think, to I think the end of season three as well. And, and another thing is not only does Morgana's attitude shift so suddenly towards Gwen, but I mean, um, you see that Gwen figures out what's happening with Morgana, that Morgana no longer has their best intentions at heart. But I feel like Gwen kind of instantly grows cold. Like, I mean, this is a problem with the way that the writers write Gwen in general, but it's like not only can Gwen never mourn I guess the people that she's actually, you know, like lost to death in her life, but she can't even mourn like her relationship, relationships lost like to Morgana. You, you see kind of this like instant shift to Gwen being like, you know, we have to do something about Morgana, blah, 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 blah. And we never really get like a true impacting moment where, you know, Gwen is just sad that this has happened. Like how, how could she miss this kind of thing? You know, how could she not see what was happening to Morgana until now. I think yeah. that's something that was really missing. Yeah, definitely. I think it's very much just that she she realizes something's wrong and then she just accepts that Morgana's kind of evil now, I guess. Well, it's like I just, it's not done well. It's very clumsy. It just feels like that whole turn had so much more potential. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of just disappointing for a relationship that we've seen flourish for two seasons. It's, it's I think, a real disconnect, and it's something that I really noticed, you know, even on just my first watch through of Merlin. I think it's even more noticeable the more I watch, but even on the first watch through, I was like, this does not seem right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'm thinking that it's probably we know that the writers on this show aren't great at writing female characters and even worse when it's like POC characters and it's, it's not very it's bad so I'm thinking the writers just cared too much about Merlin and Arthur to actually make an effort in how they portrayed Gwen and Morgana's relationship in that turn yeah, that could be it. And it's it's like I understand that Merlin and Arthur are like kind of the heart of the show and they are the main characters. And so they will get 
I say this, they will get the most development, even though, you know, Arthur questionable, but they will get the most time, I guess, dedicated to them. But the fact of the matter is that Gwen and Morgana are also main characters. They might not be the center, kind of like Merlin and Arthur are, but a little bit insulting to dedicate so little time to fleshing out a relationship between another set of main characters on the show. Yeah. Yeah, because calling them side characters would kind of be diminishing them. They're not. They're (laughs) among the main characters. Like, it's, oh, yeah, it annoys me a lot. I think another thing, and this is kind of a, this is the thing that we mentioned in our last uh, shipping episode as well. And I think it's maybe less evident, but still um, applicable to them is uh, their power imbalance, which is always going to, I guess, be a source of, of, bad in a relationship if that's something that exists yeah yeah and it's i think it's kind of obvious if you think about it for more than five seconds (laughs) because because you know morgana is like gwen's her servant and that's maybe a bit of a hurdle if you want to commit to a romantic relationship like it could go very wrong very quickly and I think that you know Morgana she can be a bit of a privileged brat at times even though she is justified in many of her feelings she's still a princess you know yeah I I mean she still grew up in that like life of nobility and so you know I think their relationship is definitely a lot more solid and like the power imbalance isn't as terrible as let's say like in in Merthyr where I feel like that is a lot more obvious and there's a lot more problems that comes with that and Arthur as well um, is a lot more focused on that where I feel like Morgana is not so much but regardless Morgana still grew up with with that experience and she's still going to subconsciously even if she doesn't you know notice it do things I guess that feed into that power imbalance <clears throat> but again i will say that it's a little bit less it's i would say it's less of a problem than maybe in some other dynamics that we've seen with a, a power imbalance i guess in the show yeah or at least it's less obvious yeah less obvious that's a good way to put it i guess in terms of interactions is there anything else that really stood out to you kind of the way that they interact with each other especially in the later seasons that you're like oh this is not good i mean it's just generally bad i don't think there's much more to say actually i think i wish there was more to analyze but the fact that it's just not good (laughs) is just what it is yeah because at like by the time season five rolls around it's pretty clear that Morgana mostly sees Gwen as a pawn in her schemes and she just uses her whenever she sees fit and it's mm, it's not it's not great nope <laughs> not great at all we have this comment um which goes kind of well into another point that I wanted to make and I'll, I can read that it's from a listener Ursus Marie who says I'm sure this is like the thing, but for bad or fix it, just forgetting that they were friends. And on a different note, the Dark Tower episode probably crosses a line for the actual ship, though it is an interesting study for their relationships past and how Morgana actually feels or felt about Gwen and it as a um, yeah, and as it goes to their relationship, kind of. This was a bit incoherent, but I have thoughts about more Gwen, so here we are. Well, thank you for your thoughts about more Gwen. Uh, we also have thoughts, and they're also incoherent, so we feel that. <laughs> We're always incoherent on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honestly, people listening so no to this, worries. wow, what a concept. <laughs> <laughs> it, it astounds me every time that people uh, continue to listen, so yeah. This really hits on, so we talked about the fact, you know, the forgetting, how that's just really weird and something that was terribly written, but um, Ursus Murray brings up the Dark Tower episode, which, I mean, like, I guess in general, I I have just a huge problem with, because for me, that's an episode that really also kind of cements this point in their relationship where I'm like, I do not see this being really viable after that. 
Yeah. There's really no going back after that, I think. It's just... Mm, no. But I think at that point... Because we've talked about both Morgana and Gwen's character arcs before on this podcast. And I think at that point, Morgana is just evil. And she's just turned into this yeah. sort of v- villain character who is like she's not much more than evil like that's most of what she is at that point so it's makes sense that her and Gwen like their relationship is just not it's it's just not gonna happen at that point is it (laughs) I mean it's just she I mean not only that episode but in the couple of episodes to follow Gwen you know is basically under you know like manipulation from Morgana and I think the really haunting thing you see is that Morgana is kind of calmed to have Gwen on her side I mean they share like a couple of like I just think of this specific hug where you know Morgana has this like look on her face of like relief that Gwen is there but I mean if you think about it the moment is so twisted because like Gwen isn't even in her right mind she doesn't know you know, the real Gwen inside of her doesn't really know, even know what's happening, that, you know, that she's there, what she's really doing. Um, And here Morgana is just, I don't know, like, I think it's like a subtle thing of like confliction there, all all out of the blue suddenly after like two seasons. Um, But it's just, I don't know, it's just like always really haunting when I think about it, because I'm like, oh, that's so twisted. (laughs) Yeah. And I think... What I think about when I think about that scene is, first of all, I think that Morgana at that point still thinks that she's justified in all that she's done. Yeah, I would say that. And I think that getting Gwen to be on her side, I think in that moment, because I still think that she is using Gwen as a pawn, um, mm-hmm. in the grand scheme of things but I think maybe in that moment she also allows herself some kind of selfish indulgence in that it's like I have a friend she's here with me she still loves me even after all this time even though she knows that she doesn't because she's not there on her own volition but I'm thinking that maybe she just allows herself to pretend that they're still friends in that moment and now I'm sad. Yeah, I like like that scene just for that like fact that we never really get this hesitation or conflict from her, even though it is kind of like a haunting thing when you think about all like the 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 uh, you know the situation around it and what the situation is in that current moment. Um, but what frustrates me is that that's not something that we've had consistently. You know this this hesitation or anything. So it's like yeah. yes, okay, now we have this like little moment. And maybe it could be, it could, you know, be more important or be more impactful if this is something that we had had more often. I don't know. Yeah. But it was, it was kind of, ah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> no, I but got. you're right. It's definitely, I feel the same. I feel, I feel like even though that scene, it could hold so many connotations, but it's, it's kind of a reach to go there since mm-hmm. we haven't gotten anything else in the later seasons. Like what's mm. right. And I just think about how far that Morgana has just fallen to think that after torturing, you know, Gwen in the dark tower and manipulating her that I don't know that, that this is something that is like, okay, or justified that like, this is something that she has to do as a means to an end it's just like you just see how far morgana has just i guess plummeted um as time has gone on yeah it's very sad and i do stand by the fact that i think that morgana's story is interesting Mm -hmm. although tragic and although we've talked about the many problems i have with it i do think it's very like it could have been interesting to a degree much higher than what it became i don't know uh it's yeah that if there was hesitation there from her part i think that would have made 
that whole season and that whole part of her arc so much more impactful and so much more tragic as well. Yeah. I think another thing I just have a problem with is that this all is... She is so against Gwen because of this idea of destiny, that Gwen is destined to take the throne that Morgana feels, you know, she she deserves to have. And so it's like another instance of destiny just being the absolute worst in this show. <laughs> like, I know, yeah. I know it's like the theme, but it's literally like because of destiny, Morgana's like, okay, well, Gwen needs to just die. Like, so that this doesn't happen that she doesn't assume the throne that i'm supposed to to have and you know then we get this conflict between the two this is just another instance of heteronormativity ruining everything tragic (laughs) because you know what if the dream was just gwen becoming queen she could like she could have married morgana (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right uh, Gwen they can dragon oh i marry her iconic yeah that's, that's my take my rewrite I like your take that's the twist um <laughs> the, the real merlin twist i love it <laughs> um do you want to read this uh ask that we got from a listener yes Did this we'll see we if we got... close off this section with this yeah uh, we got this question from King Dowager, who asked, How much of Morgana and Gwen's relationship in the later seasons was OOC slash flaw in the writing, and how much of it was realistic? Adding on to this, do you think either of them could have actually killed the other, given the opportunity? Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> I was going to say, I will say, uh, I will say for the writing, um... I mean, maybe I'm biased. We know how much I just like harp on the writers as if I could write a whole show on this on this podcast. But I would say a lot of it's out of... I would... Like, when we just take their relationship into perspective, I think, I'll, I mean, just most of it's out of character, in my opinion. In my very humble opinion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of... <sighs> yeah, it's... Yeah, yeah. Both of them, actually. I was going to say that Gwen in the later seasons I'm just like where is her personality what is she doing um but the same goes for Morgana like where is her personality she's just evil <laughs> there's nothing there. <laughs> that is that's my like, person I'm... that's like a sims personality trait yeah they it's really the evil like trait. that <laughs> they gave Gwen good <laughs> <laughs> they're like okay Morgana has the evil trait Gwen has the good trait <laughs> I'm seeing like the devil pick and like the thumbs the thumbs up like <laughs> That's a. They just put that in there. <laughs> yeah. As to if they could have killed each other, I'm gonna say no. Ooh. Why? That's. I don't know. I just. I don't. <laughs> I mean, I don't feel like Gwen could have killed Morgana because I feel like Gwen would struggle to kill anyone. Um. I mean, in a pinch, she could. Mm-hmm. But I don't think that it would have. Like, I think it would have been very hard for her to kill someone that she had a relationship with once even though it turned very bad um as for morgana i think it's just wishful thinking and i don't think that she would (laughs) you're just like i'm going to choose to believe that it wouldn't happen i think like she did it she had a chance to but she didn't Mm, True. like why go to all that trouble to use Gwen to manipulate Arthur when she could have just killed her. That is true. I do kind of see it this way, that, like, if they're, like, just alone, the two of them going head-to-head, I think it's a lot less likely they would kill one another than if, for example, they, for some reason, were fighting and Morgana was threatening to kill, like, Merlin or Arthur or something like that. I think in that situation, Gwen would maybe be able to kill her like, because she's directly about to, like, you know, kill someone else that she loves, and it's kind of, like, a conflicting thing. But I think when they're, like, together, like, head-to-head, like, one-on-one, um, I mean, we see with Morgana, she just chooses to manipulate her instead of kill her, so yeah, I think it would be a lot more difficult in a situation like that for them. So I don't know. That's a... That's in- I guess it depends kind of <laughs> just on the day, the situation, the timing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. how the stars are aligned whether or not one of them just marks the other 
True. Yeah. Well, do you, Edith, have any more, I guess, comments on the bad? I feel like I always have a lot more to say about the bad. Does it really reflect the way I think about the relationship? It's just, like, more interesting to talk about. Yeah, but I think it's always easier to talk about the bad things because the good is so much just based on how I feel when I think about them. It's like, <laughs> it's a lot harder to say something interesting about, oh, I just feel happy <laughs> when i think about them hugging in season one it's like yeah it's i feel like you have a lot more intelligent do. things to say about like criticism than just like the good <laughs> like, yeah because with with this show a lot of the criticism is based in very sound and reasonable argumentation like it's very easy to build a case around what the show did wrong and it's not so easy to say something <laughs> that they did right, which makes it sound like I hate this show. But I feel like that's just this podcast, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, we just sound like we hate the show always. But <laughs> here we are, 10 episodes in, talking about the yeah. show. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I guess that will do it then for our good and bad sections. And before we go to the fix it, we, we did have some extra questions that... Uh, didn't we didn't really know where to put them so we're going to take like an interlude time to not only talk about some questions that we got sent and comments but also talk about uh, some fic recs we got so Edith would you like to start us off with our first extra question yes um, so the first question is from Arthur Pendragons and they ask which dynamic of their relationship do you personally find more compelling before Morgana became evil or after I'm going to say before I'm going to say before as well just because I think like as we stated earlier that's where like all like we see um what their relationship is like and we see kind of uh, how much they care for each other all that's developed I will say if after was treated the way that you know i personally think it should have been treated i think that would have been a, the more compelling dynamic just because True. it would have been like yes it would have been tragic but it would have been so impactful had it been treated yeah. correctly or handled correctly. i think if if they had written uh after better i think i would feel the same uh mm -hmm. because that sort of I, I, especially for what it would do to Gwen's arc, I think, in that it would make her choose between. Because, you know, Morgana is justified in a lot of the things that she does, and Gwen has a lot of reason to hate Uther. So it could have gone differently if the show hadn't been cowards and allowed Gwen to feel complex emotions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> basically. Basically, but I guess for now, uh, it's a uh, before every time because, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, reasons. Uh, we have another question from a listener track down that snitch who says, if you look at the scenes in season three between Morgos and Morgana, and then the ones between Gwen and Morgana in season five, they look startlingly similar. My first thought is uh, that the parallel was created to show more Gwen as reunited loved ones, like Morgos and Morgana were, which would imply that Morgana still cared about Gwen, but Morgana knew she was manipulating Gwen. If she saw the parallel, she may have felt she was manipulated by Morgos in season three. How far do you think she cared about Gwen in season five, if at all? What do you got, Edith? I've never thought about this, but it's very, it's interesting I feel like I'm going to have to think about this next time I rewatch season five. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's interesting to think about. And I think it goes back to what we talked about before um, in that I do think that Morgana cared about Gwen in season five, or at least I think that she, she did to the extent that she was able to care about someone, basically. Yeah, I feel like I'm wondering if it was kind of a case of she she missed kind of this memory she had of Gwen and her relationship in a sense. Like, yeah, as even because like as she's holding a Gwen in her arms, that's not really the Gwen she ever knew. It's kind of like she's pretending for a second that it is all okay 
And the way, because I made a parallel guest set about this, and the way that, you know, Gwen cradled Morgana in her arms when she was having, like, her nightmares and everything, now Morgana is holding Gwen, kind of like this twisted parallel that, like, um, I remember the song I used was Unknown to You by Jacob Banks, but there's the lyrics, like, this is, um, here, here's, wait, no, like, here's how it started, this is how it ends, something like that. And um, just... Yeah, this like wholesome thing that she's kind of a little bit still holding on to, but like because you know she has gone so far down this path and herself has become so so twisted, like this like memory of the relationship also is twisted, something like that. You know, pretend that said something intelligent to the, in that. No, but I manner. think that's <laughs> I think you hit the nail on the head there. I think it's she she cares about this idea of Gwen and this idea of what she like they had something in the past and now Morgana doesn't have anyone anymore and so she looks back on it fondly but she doesn't really see Gwen as her own person at that point so I do think that she cares about her but she doesn't actually in the way that like in a way that means something to Gwen yeah like she doesn't have her best interest in heart like at all for sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah we do have another question and it feels wrong i'm not responsible for this, this please but i am not gonna responsible. read it because you are responsible for this no okay listen <laughs> this is it's your my sin influence. To bear. it's my influence but i did not ask anyone for this question this comment or whatever uh, edith you may go ahead and read it while i suffer i believe you uh we have a question from an anonymous user it's about Gion. It goes like this. I have to point out the parallels between Gion and Morgwen. The noble who stands up for what they believe is right. For Leon, that involve, involves following Arthur before Uther. And the dedicated, skilled servant who goes above and beyond to make their employers happy. The flowers could not have come under Gwen's job description. And the buffet of fruit? Really, George? Also, Leon surviving the impossible and Morgana dreaming the impossible. Not a question, just food for thought. <laughs> I just the genuine amount of like brain power and dedication it takes to like come up with this parallel. Like I applaud it. <laughs> I've said it before, and I'll say it again. One thing I did not anticipate in 2020, among the other things, is that the fandom suddenly would care about George. And yeah, here we are. Here it's uh, happened. I will say it's a very, a very solid parallel to make. Whoever did it, good job. Your your uh, your efforts are not, uh, I guess, will not go unrecognized. Um, I don't know if I have anything to add except for this is iconic, and I screamed when I saw this. It is funny. I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. a round of applause. Truly, truly, an effort made. Yeah. Um, we do love the parallels out here. I think sometimes I'm like bad at drawing parallels on my own, but when I see like some good ones, I'm like, ooh, this is a nice. I do like that people, you know, have have you know brains and thoughts, unlike me. So it's nice to see. I mean, same. Why do you think I'm studying the humanities? It's literally just reading <laughs> things and being like, this person said this, so this must be true. I mean, yeah, I'm like studying Russian linguistics and English linguistics so same <laughs> same same well those were all the extra questions we had uh, that didn't fit into fix it or good or bad really so uh yeah we're just gonna talk about some fic recs we got really quick and then yeah go ahead and do the rest of it um Edith do you want to I know you just read one but I'm going to be talking about some of the fix for the rest of the book. So do you want to read this one anonymous <laughs> message that we got? Yes. So we got a fic rec from an anonymous listener. And they said, I'm very fond of Morgana, Merlin and Magic Oh My by Dancing Hopper on AO3. Uh, it's got that season one Morgwen vibe. And I like that they're the main love story, even though the fic itself explores most of the relationships between the main four. I also feel like the author just utterly loves Gwen and is using the opportunity to gush over her. And that is personally exactly what I want in a fic. Sounds great. I've not I've not read this. I did check it out, but it was, it was like a little bit too long for my schedule um, this week. 
but I've marked it for later for sure. Uh, I do it be loving. It sounds lovely. Those. Yeah, I think with fix as well. Um, most of the fix either from our are either a use or focus on like one and two. I feel like not as many will try to go and tackle um, or one, two or three, but you know, in a way that kind of brings Morgana back. And I'm, I don't feel like a lot really try to tackle five so much um, in yeah. my experience from what I've seen. Yeah. But I think it's probably because it's, you know, people don't want to work with a toxic relationship. When right. They which good. Some little fix, yeah. which is nice. <laughs> I do I do really like this comment about um loving the way you can feel that the author just loves Gwen because that's also my favorite type of fic is when you can really tell that someone just loves a character so much. Yeah. It really that. just comes out in the writing, I think, and it makes it so much more <laughs> enjoyable that way as well. I I don't know, did you back when you were reading Merlin Fix, did you read a lot of more Gwen? Not a lot, because I think this was back in, like, you know, 2013. Mm -hmm. Femme Slash has never been the, you know, f f f on the forefront of fandom. And back then, I was, like, halfway in the closet, so, you know, I wasn't as into it. Nowadays, though, I would... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful Except I don't read Merlin fix, and I'm probably not going to read any, but I I might. I might. The thought is there. Love, I love Mogwen so much that I actually might. This week, maybe I will actually check out the fic regs. I never do, but this week, maybe I will. <laughs> this week, maybe. I will mention two more and kind of describe them that I really like and I've read, and then like some other ones by name. But all the fics we mentioned will be in the description of um, the, the podcast post that we make and the YouTube description. Um, so you guys can go check those out there. And uh, another fic, this is my favorite one. It's called It's Only Ever Been You by Love Bender on AO3. And it's, it's super funny. It's an AU. And basically the premise is, and this isn't a spoiler, it's like in the summary, that Morgana, I guess, doesn't realize that she's dating Gwen in a sense. Um, like she's kind of thinking, it's like she's pining, but doesn't realize that what they're doing is kind of dating anyway. And it's super, super funny. Like just really made me genuinely laugh so much. Like I, it's, I really love it. So I really recommend It's Only uh, Ever Been You by Love Bender. And then we also have... Um, Crave the Brush of Spring by Alyssa Still Stands. It was written, I think, recent. Like these were both written this year as well, and uh, we'll hear from Alyssa later in, in the podcast here soon. But Crave the Brush of Spring is basically this exploration of you know when Morgana has already kind of turned um, away from Camelot and to the other side, and just uh, the exploration of their relationship throughout that and and how that develops and what happens to Morgana and Gwen. So I can really recommend that as well. Otherwise, um, I'll read off the titles and then we'll move on here in a second. We have got Kindness Such As This by Just A Wave Function, A Thimble Of Light For An Acre Of Sky by uh, Selanios, The Ivy Crown by Anonymous, which I think we've had wrecked before, In Our Quiet Hour by Lupinelli, Always uh, and always been the tower by Spring of Violets. And again, we'll put those in the description. Yeah. Lovely. Lovely, lovely. So uh, now that we're done talking about fix, maybe we can talk about fix it. Love that. I do. And we have a special guest joining us this time for our fix it segment in which we kind of combined canon and post canon together this time we'll just talk about fix it in general and our guest today is Alyssa, otherwise known as Alyssa still stands on tumblr and on ao3 she is the author of some instant more more Gwen classics such as crave the brush of spring and the sun at noon which i'm sure you guys out there probably have already read if you're really into more Gwen. And a wonderful artist. So thank you for joining us today, Alyssa. Thank you all so much for having me and for that lovely intro. It's possibly more than I deserve. So, <laughs> I mean, they are things that you did. So <laughs> wonderful fix written, wonderful art made. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're thankful to have a guest with us uh, here today because it's always more fun that way. And um, I'm sure people get tired of just hearing Edith and I talk all the time. So <laughs> nice to have another voice. As, as a podcast listener, we, we do not. So that's <laughs> assured. I mean, sometimes we have to invite other people who can say smart things because we run out of smart things to say. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our brain cell doesn't work sometimes. <laughs> a shared brain cell. Well, mm-hmm. all right. I guess we'll just dive into the fix it segment and we'll start it off with some comments and questions by some podcast listeners. And Edith, do you want to start us off with this first comment? That I we got? sure can. So, uh, an anonymous listener asked Hiya, I have a more Gwen fix it if you'd like. Uh, One thing that I honestly think would have made Morgana's descent feel more realistic, by which I mean not zero to a hundred immediately, would have been involving Gwen. If Morgana's descent was paralleled by her fading romance with Gwen, it would have made it would make everyone involved feel more human and less convenient plot pieces to sideshow Arthur. Uh, Not to mention that it would also give Gwen more of a character in the later seasons. Thanks for listening to my rant. Well, thanks for sending your rant, because it was great. Yes. And I agree. Why not? Why not give give us some good old lesbian content in this show, please? I'm begging. Truly. Truly. <laughs> Just the pure begging. Um, Alyssa, what, what what are some thoughts that you have about this comment? Submitted I to think us? my thoughts are twofold. First, absolutely. I think that even showing some basis for her previous relationship with Gwen and how she is struggling with with her emotions and grappling with with the implications of hurting someone she deeply cares for, I think that would definitely help Moriana's descent feel more grounded and gradual, and it would give more dimension to her character. However, um, I think that in a plot like this, it is important to have Gwen like occupy a role outside of that romance like admitted uh, admittedly having a fading romance between Gwen and Morgana as as Morgana turns quote-unquote evil would give her more uh, of a role within the narrative but I also think that it's just important for her to have an arc outside of that um I I am a Gwen Sam (laughs) above all things so you might find that to be a recurring role in a lot of my answers. And I also think, like, why have it fading too much? Like, why not just have anguished lesbian romance, you know? Keep on that that angst. Yeah, that profound, angsty, anguished romance. I agree there. And I definitely agree with the point that when it comes, I guess when it comes to storylines like this, where you do have romances that you have to be careful that it, the romance, I guess, doesn't like consume the characters and what they are and what they stand for in a way that yeah, they, like you definitely. said, that Gwen has like a place outside of that. Morgana has a place outside of that, but I think it would be really cool. Like it would have been a really cool kind of parallel. So maybe not so much the fading, like you said, but like the, yeah. the angsty side. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, I want them to like dig into the mutual love and resentment and <laughs> anguish and that is what they oh, want. it's so good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, thinking about all the possibilities and oh, I want it now. Please. We want many yeah. things in this world. <laughs> There's like so many ideas I have and I'm like, if only they could write themselves, you know? God, I know. God. I love that. <laughs> the fanfic writers struggle. <laughs> do I exactly. write this or do I wait for anyone else to write it and then no one writes it and I'll just sit here and wait. <laughs> if only if I wait. Yeah. Right. It's like if I wait long enough, maybe my patience will be rewarded, but usually it's nothing happens. You're just suffering. So Yeah. A lesson just to write, write things on your own if if you can, if if you have the time. Um but yeah, thank you again, uh anonymous listener, for that wonderful comment. Um we have after this, two more comments uh, from both from user uh, King Dowager. Uh, first one is, if Morgana, or I guess more of a question, if Morgana had become queen after turning evil and Gwen had been on her side, 
would she make Gwen her queen of equal power? Ooh. Nice thought. I mean, I think I think she definitely would have tried. But I don't think that Gwen would have gone along with it. Or like I I have such a hard time seeing Gwen on Morgana's side once she has truly like t- <laughs> it's hard to say because it's if <laughs> Because some of Morgana's motivations are really sane at the like yeah. at their core. So maybe she could have convinced Gwen to be on her side. It's just that I don't think that men would agree. Oh, I don't know. I think my take on this is it depends on how we interpret Morgana's quote unquote turn. Because I think that Gwen has a lot of reason to be angry towards Camelot, especially after the death of her father. Oh, yes. And especially since after she views how much harm Uther's regime has done to the people of Camelot. And I think that if if we maintain her core traits of loyalty towards the people, towards her people, if if, if, if we kind of maintain the core traits of her wanting to, to see her people live in prosperity. I think if Morgana's turn against Camelot is portrayed differently and with more nuance, I think there is a chance that we can see Gwen joining her. Um, yeah. But that's just me. And I think I think Morgana would try, but I also think that Morgana in this show, she has very noble motivations, but she is also a child of privilege who has privileged ideas about power and power re- relations. So I think that she would try to, t- to give Gwen equal power, but that is something that they would have to, t- t- to figure out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. definitely. And the way that I think about it as well is a lot would have to be different for, th- for me personally, in my mind, for the scenario even to work. Um, because canon as i guess as we have it now i would say there's kind of no way i would see this happening yeah. um even with like a few changes like i think morgana yeah would have definitely have had to approach this a lot differently for gwen to even consider kind of being on board because like on the other side of morgana are people like arthur and merlin you know who she loves a lot and yeah, so definitely yeah, yeah, it's definitely a difficult situation, but I love the imagery of it. I think it's iconic. Yes. <laughs> T- Dual queens is everything I want in life. Yeah. I I also think that that they should have just leaned in more in sort of seasons late four and five into kind of like the dueling queens imagery because they are Ooh, opposite mirroring queens. And yeah, instead, of, instead of just making Gwen like a pawn. Yeah, you can yeah. use yeah. things instead sometimes. of making her a cardboard figure that was never fully developed in seasons four and five. Okay, no, I'm not better. <laughs> well, I am. Uh, <laughs> we're all bitter. It's bad. we're all just mired in the in, in bitterness here. Yeah. This um, speaking of dueling queens, so um, this is kind of like a two parter question, I guess. So continuation from King Dowager. So um. I guess this is me adding on to it right now, but let's let's take away like the obstacles um, and the things that you would have to change to make it possible, I guess, and just focus on this question the way it is. Like, if they were queens together, do you think Morgwen, like as the dual queenship, so this is from King Dowager, could have ruled Camelot better than Arwen or better than Merther? So, like, is like the Morgwen dynamic, I guess, versus the Arwen dynamic of ruling and the Merther dynamic of ruling. Uh, what are some of your thoughts? I that? will say this. I think I think they had potential, and I think that potential is Gwen. Um, because I mm. think Gwen is really she's a really good queen, which is why I would say Mertha mm, oh. <laughs> chaotic. <laughs> I think for, for magic, Mertha I think is really good for like um like magic as well. I mean like more Gwen as well, I guess on more Gwen, side. Yeah. Because we're gonna but be like high priestess, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess Merthyr and more Gwen have that magic side that like Arwen don't have. Like that's yes. that's the, I guess yeah. like what I could see the good in the Merthyr ruling. Yeah, but since more Gwen also have that, I think exactly. I, 
But then again, yeah. you know, Morgana, she has a tendency to be a bit power hungry and privileged, as we've said. So I don't know. I mean, I think they all have their um, flaws when it, when it comes to rulership, especially Arthur and Morgana, because they were raised in such similar positions and sort of have, I think, comp- complementary attitudes towards power. But I do agree that Gwen is kind of the key here. She is a wonderful queen, and any queenship with and any ruling system with her, I think, would be good. So, what do you think would have happened if, like, Arthur had died and then Gwen remarried Lancelot because he didn't die in this world? <laughs> in a different world, I think. I mean, I think they would have rolled really well together. <laughs> in I think my so. Opinion, but, but which might have been refreshing for Camelot because I'm sure you know they didn't. They both don't have all traditions and everything memorized, so I think they could carve a new path with their like own unique experience that yeah. doesn't parallel the experience of like born nobles. So I think that would have been really interesting and refreshing, I guess. I guess like at that point, why keep the monarchy? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dissolve. Dissolve. Dissolve the monarchy of Camelot. No more Albion. We're, we're doing this right now. Merlin just failed out, right? I mean, that's that's always a thought as like a modern person. Yeah, exactly. You're like, like okay, why? yeah, um, but why do we even have the system? Like, please. Why main? I mean, it's because the kingship is such a potent symbol, like a potent co- cultural symbol. But like, why keep it? You know? Yeah. I mean, I live in a country with a constitutional monarchy, and I ask myself every day, why? Why? They don't do anything. <laughs> Just sit there. <laughs> yeah, I guess for us, they're, um, I guess, well, not for me, but like for, for you, for example, it's just like a figurehead. Whereas I guess for them, for, you know, Camelot times, it's like the king, you know, actually does things. That like, is true. Laws actually, you know, get formed yeah. there and he actually enforces things. So <sighs> a lot more hands on. Yeah. This is my call out post to the Swedish royal family. <laughs> what are you doing at Sweden? When are you leaving? Just get out. Get out. Okay. You just said get out of my country, <laughs> Swedish royal family. <laughs> oh, well. I mean, the oh. prince has already did. She moved to the US with her American husband, I think. I don't know. I don't keep track of them anymore. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> more Gwen. Indeed. More Gwen. Well, uh, thank you again to everyone who submitted those questions. We have some questions of our own that we wanted to discuss. And so uh, we'll keep the Fix It vibes rolling. Edith, would you like to pose this question for us, this next one? I mean, it's very simple. Alyssa, how would you fix the evil Morgana and Gwen relationship? That's not that simple. I guess. So simple. Very easy. No, I know. <laughs> it's a very um, short question. I it's think... a very it has very broad implications. <laughs> I mean, certainly. I think that at the heart of it, I think there needs to be more room for emotional complexity for the both of them. Like for for Morgana, especially, like during and after her turn. We see her call for Gwen's execution in season three, episode 13. We see her bring Lancelot back in 409. And we, we, we of course, see, like, the the Dark Tower eps. And these are episodes where she just profoundly hurt Gwen in escalating ways and and systematically stripped her away her agency and tried to hurt her in every way that she knew how. And I think sh- she should show more conflict in in those moments. And I would like to see her grapple with their previous relationship. I, I would like to-, to see her sort of wonder about how things could be t- different if Gwen were on her side, especially especially since Gwen has been so wronged by Uther's regime. These are all points that I made before. But I also think that 
it's important on the flip side for Gwen to feel complicated emotions towards Mor Morgana, not simply as an enemy of Camelot and not simply as someone who had formerly been very close to her, her close companion, her lady. I, I want to see her grapple with that past and just be able to feel the full range of emotions, I guess. Yeah. I think that a lot of the issue, if we are to read more Gwen into the later seasons, is like the kind of the same issue which haunts the rest of BBC Merlin, which is like this idea of destiny, this idea of a p potential future messing up everything in the present. Because in in season four, episode 13, there's a scene where Gwen and Morgana duel. And then Gwen kind of exclaims, what did I do to make you hate me so much? And Morgana replies, it's not what you did, it's what you are destined to do. I'm sorry, Gwen, but I can never let that, that happen. And I think it's just the reliance on prophecy, on notions of destiny, on notions of this vague and mythic future, which compels characters to act in ways which are I think out of line with what we have been presented in the present of the canon. And I think that we have to confront that relationship with the future if we want to build any sort of meaningful relationship in in the plot going forward. Um, yeah. So would you say, um, just to make sure I'm getting this right, that in order, I guess to, to mend their relationship, Morgana would have to kind of confront, I guess, the idea of destiny and what that necessarily means to her, like what's more important yeah. to her kind of thing. Yeah, I think she would have to confront destiny. I think she would have to confront um, how her own actions have um, not been in the best favor for the people of Camelot. I'm basically saying that uh, in in order for this r romance to work, in my eyes, there, th there needs to be character development on both of their ends um yes which sorry that's yeah i have n nothing specific i i, I want that's okay. to do in terms of fix it yeah yeah i think it's difficult to talk about because i mean we've said this before but i think gwen at some point in the show she's not really a character because she doesn't have they, the show doesn't allow her to have complicated emotions. Yes. Like most of her relationships Definitely. and emotions are very clean. And as soon as it gets a little bit like with Lancelot, they couldn't like they couldn't allow her to. Mm, it's they just can't allow her to do things that are not this, you know, perfect woman who is nice to everyone. Yes. And, yeah. And, and not yes. allowing her that is making discussing this in a completely canon sense very difficult because yeah exactly it would, yeah it would be necessarily necessary for her to be able to express complicated emotions <laughs> and the writers <laughs> don't know how to do that apparently yeah it's like we we talk a lot about how sudden morgana's turn is but that turn is mirrored by how sudden Gwen's feelings turn towards her as well because the writers wrote this very abrupt fall going from quote-unquote good to quote-unquote bad and so we, we don't get to see any of the complexity and that's a damn shame so yeah yeah that's true I definitely did notice um on some of my last rewatches just how quickly I mean even I don't know I have a hard time thinking Gwen so so drastically like her feelings so drastically changed towards Morgana even in finding out that there she doesn't even get to like lament like a friendship loss I know yeah um, it's kind of yeah not that I think about it that definitely is true that's very fast how that yeah. all but I, I also think it's like I think the writers want us to think that it's justified by Morgana's seeming moral turn in canon because that is the logic of the show the the logic of the show is that camelot is good and the logic of the show is that gwen is good yeah. and they expect that to make sense somehow despite the fact that it's not founded in her character to turn on her friends so quickly yeah yeah there's a lot of yeah. 
potential complexity that they never yeah. dove into. That's true. And Alyssa, so how would you imagine Gwen and Morgana getting together in canon? So like, what, what would you fix when then? So I guess this doesn't necessarily have to apply to evil just as a whole. Like, would when, when would you put them together? When? I think that early season sort of get togethers and sort of later season get togethers have very different uh, flavors, I guess, for lack of a better term. Because like for for the early seasons, I'm thinking like it it would be so like ideas like them getting together at sparring practice or when Gwen does Morgana's hair or, or the stays on her dress or like scenes with Morgana watching Gwen at her father's forge and them dancing at the feast. And like, I really want Morgana and Gwen to be open and to communicate with each other. So I think Gwen should know about Morgana's magic. And then I want Morgana to give Gwen flowers to mirror the flowers that Gwen gave her early in season one. And like I, I want them to be able to talk to each other. And I think like these, these lighter, sort of wonderful get to, to, together ideas are possible in in earlier s- seasons. Whereas in later se- seasons, I think, I think the most obvious get together timeline would be after Gwen's exile, in season four, episode nine aka the episode that haunts me in my sleep um, i i despise it i despise it but i think then would be a moment for gwen to sort of fully sort of express her resentment towards camelot but also her resentment towards Mor- morgana especially if she discovers that morgana was the one who reanimated Lancelot, which I don't think she ever does in canon, question mark. Not that I know of. <laughs> yeah. Well, because Gwen doesn't even know why she cheated, so... Yeah. Oh, God. Okay. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. But yeah, I think that moment, had. there's a lot to expand on there. Um, but yeah. And then in season five, either um, maybe there's... I've seen fixits where the Dark Tower episodes fail. And I think like the Dark Tower is kind of one of my main points of inflection in thinking about Morwen because I think that's where any kind of simple arc of redemption can end. But I think a lot of p- potential um trajectories branch off from the from that point. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah, and I guess if we talk about these, like, I guess, pre-turn get-togethers, post-turn get-togethers, would you say that the Dark Tower is kind of this, like, point of no return for Morgana and Morgwen, or would you point it to be, like, another part? Like, where would you say, like, okay, here I'd have, like, real difficulty, or here I don't think it would be possible anymore for Morgana to change or for Morgwen to get to be, like, a thing? I think, okay, when I saw that uh, that question on your outline, I think I took that more in sort of um, an external sense, like what point do I think that a, a relationship between them would be quote unquote bad? And I think that okay. yeah. I think that that is once again another complicated question to um, answer because for me, the the the, the dark tower episodes are where. I think any simple arc towards redemption, if we want to use the term redemption, or 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 any simple arc towards repentance ends for Morgana because of how upsetting the episodes were, and because of also how upsetting the extra canon, um, extra narrative I- imagery was. And I think from that point on, if we do have a Morgwen romance that isn't very carefully written, we kind of fall into this trap of romance and a rom- and a rom- and a romantic partner being kind of cast as a reward for a character's re- redemption, which I think is really troubling. Yeah, and I think that any arc from that point 
forward should be very careful to preserve agency for, for Gwen, especially since those episodes sort of made her helpless without agency and vulnerable. Um, and yeah, I don't think, and I think from that point forward, it's especially important for Morgana's redemption not to be centered on romance. I think there needs to be a separation of those two two plots in general, but especially from that point forward. And I think post-canon for me, there needs to be a time skip of some kind if Morgana were to um, survive. Yeah. It's just too much has happened between Yeah, Yeah, it gets very complicated. That's why I usually prefer thinking about the earlier seasons. <laughs> they are really cute in their earlier seasons. <laughs> yeah, because the later ones, everything, yeah. mm, it gets really dark really fast, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I found it really interesting that you did take it from that perspective of when it would be like bad for them to be together because... Yeah, it's like once it gets to that certain point, then I don't. Yeah, it's. I just don't see this being <laughs> healthy for for anyone. Um, yeah. If the if things if things progress the way that they do in canon, at least yeah. you know. And but I mean, not the way that maybe some we would plan it out. I guess otherwise. Yeah, I think for me it's like healthy or toxic, or if we were t- to use that terminology, I think any of, of those things beside the point almost I st- I think it's an interesting and compelling dynamic still but I do agree that it would not be good for them to be together in a simple r- romantic sense given how the show progresses yeah yeah I don't like <clears throat> this is this fix it segment so I guess we'll just talk about this as if we had written it but i will say that i would not trust the writers to do a good job yes. with this uh 100 <laughs> percent. <laughs> so maybe it was better that it didn't happen because if it had happened it could have been even worse yeah. it would have been than disastrous it was. <laughs> yeah definitely yeah i don't like the way it went was bad enough let's yeah. just say, say that sure was yeah. Don't need to make it worse with like a tragic like bury your gaze romance yet again, you know? Yeah. Like Morgana just dies. And then like your gaze are depressed. Like we don't need that. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> yeah. Well God. do are there like other when you think fix it, are there like any other like general thoughts you have or things that you would fix or when it comes to more Gwen or yeah, any other, I guess, closing statements here? <laughs> closing oh god. I mean I think generally I think one of my favorite early season fix it ideas would be Gwen finding out that Morgana had tried to kill Uther for her sake. And just, like, I want to know how she reacts in that case. And I I want to know how her sort of... I, I feel like Gwen is one of the more pacifist characters in, in this show. And I want to know how that would play out against her love for Morgana and knowing Morgana's current um, affection towards Uther and knowing her anger towards Uther for killing her father. Like, I think there's a lot to talk about in that scenario. And it's, it's one of my favorites. Um, I think generally this is both in fanon and in canon. I just think I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but I just think there's a tendency to, to flatten Gwen, whether for the sake of romance or not. I just think there's a tendency to flatten Gwen. And I think that, we should try to fix that in in Morgwen Fix and give her more agency and more character and just delve into all the facets of her um, generally. And, yeah. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah, I think if we already 
are here, you know, fixing things, we might as well <laughs> fix the things that would make our favorite characters that much greater. So really, though, yeah, take yeah. the time to flesh out everyone's personalities and motives and everything, and yeah. give Gwen the the capacity and the the chance to grieve the things that she has lost and to mourn the things that she should be able to mourn for more than like like half two an minutes in an episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, not even that. Like, she cries at the end, and then they're like, all right, it never happened. Next? Okay. Um, yeah, what else do I want to bring up that I don't think is good? Um, yeah, I, I haven't mentioned this so far, but I think that in certain other pairings in this fandom, people are more conscious of the power imbalance which exists therein, and people sort of push against that dynamic more, but I feel like in, in Morgwen, there's less focus on the power and the privilege Mor Morgana occupies, possibly be be because the relationship between Morgana and Gwen and Cannon is already fairly fr friendly. But I do think it's also important to unpack that yeah. when we write Morgwen. Yeah, you're right. Definitely. <laughs> Yeah, that would be a good thing to explore and fix, because I feel, like you said, I think it's something that I don't see he as heavily addressed in most Morgwen fics that I've read, as opposed to other fics that I've read Yeah, that have that dynamic. Yeah, that is true. Obviously. Yeah, because, because it's like, I feel like we perceive early season Morgwen as like being very sweet and very kind towards each other and very loving already. So, but that doesn't change the fact that, that Morgana still occupies a position of power over Gwen. Gwen yeah. is her employee, and I feel like we lose sight of that sometimes when we think about how genuinely lovely they were in the early seasons. I mean, I think it has to do with the fact that Mirtha is, like, borderline abusive sometimes. Uh <laughs> And because we never see Morgana throwing things at Gwen, we just assume that their relationship is not complicated. Yeah, it's just yeah. like, oh, this one must be 100% great. That's, that's very fair. And it's like, we see Gwen doing things for Mor Mor Morgana. We, we see Gwen giving things to Morgana re re repeatedly. And like, I don't think anyone is owed anything in a, a, a relationship, obviously. But I do think there needs to be elements of reciprocity in there yeah. and like the scenes of Gwen sort of com comforting Morgana after her nightmares and embracing her and like telling her that that she's here it's so sweet and it's so integral to their di dynamic but I want to see that reciprocated yes mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> that's true well great Edith do you have any like fix it thoughts that you want to share still or I mean, not really. I will say, I mean, this has been said before, but I think I wish that fandom cared more about fem slash fit. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Okay. I just wish people would yeah. like them. <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah. so I mean, I, I can just fix it is write more. Yeah, Ali I'm Alyssa so just has to write more to uh, appease the balance. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I've been in sort of fem slash and across a lot of different fandoms, and it's just it's a pattern of interaction and it's a pattern of attention. And yeah, there are strikingly obvious trends as to what people will like and what people will will not care about. Yes. I will say that. <laughs> I remember writing a fem slash fic for another fandom, but you know, uh, and like a few of the comments being like, oh, I love that this male ship was in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? And I'm like, that, yeah. that wasn't the point. <laughs> but like, it's I mean, not. like, you, I. I think you can compliment that, but like, you know, as long as your yeah. compliment before was like five sentences on the actual like content of like Precisely. the fake. Yeah, because I mean, no, I mean, yeah, like I wouldn't have put them in the background if I didn't like them as well, but you know. Yeah. That is that is how I feel. <laughs> Priorities. <laughs> yeah. 
well, well, well. That's good. Well, and I don't really have anything that hasn't already been said. Like, I think, Alyssa, that you made some really good points today. Glad, really glad to have had you on to, you know, be the fix it sections brain cell uh, for Edith and I. We appreciate that. I'm delighted to be here. So it's been so much fun. Yeah, I mean, I would just say I really just agree mostly with what we've talked about today, just that there has to be a real change in, like, their dynamic, and it really comes down to how their character arcs are handled, if whether or not their relationship could be, I guess, fruitful within yeah. canon. I'm sorry that I couldn't comment on any, like, real, like, points. Oh, I think here that if they did no, this no, one fine. thing, they did this one thing di- different, no, I think I think it's a lot more difficult than that yeah it is very complicated i don't think you could because you can i mean all we're doing anyway is speculating so i guess you could pick out one point if you really wanted to but so many things can turn out different if you change you know just one little thing so i mean i don't think it necessarily has to be just one point to change as much as there there could be many many different ways this could have gone so yeah i think it's just a lot more complicated than saying like oh this definitely would have worked yeah. Lord. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you again, Alyssa, so much for coming. Yeah, thanks so much. It's been so lovely. I really enjoyed this. But no, thank you all for having me, really. Yeah. All right. And we hope that you then have a good rest of your week and that you continue um, your lovely writing and drawing because <laughs> thank you. Your, your writing's cool and your drawing is also cool. So. <laughs> Thank you. I know I say I never read Merlin fix, but maybe I'll check them out. We'll see. <laughs> I I cannot judge as to their their quality. I am far too close to, to, to the project, but I will say lots of Morgwen. It is nothing but, but Morgwen content. So that's that's good enough for yeah. me, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Same to you too. Same to you. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> Bye. All right. Well, it was really fun to have Alyssa here. It's always fun to have guests on this podcast, of course. Oh, it was so nice. I really yeah. enjoyed having her. All of her magnificent brain cells. <laughs> all of that. <laughs> You, like you could feel the IQ of this <laughs> podcast raise like by tenfold in in, in yeah. that like time she spent with us. So it was nice, very lovely. Yeah. Do you have any closing thoughts on more Gwen before we leave the people with with this episode? I love them. I think they're great. Um, <laughs> I want more more Gwen in my life. Maybe I'll have to read a fic. We'll see. I'll get back to you next month because we're monthly now. Remember, guys? Um, And also just more femme slash content for the people is my campaign slogan. (laughs) (laughs) Edith is campaigning now. Uh, When she says for the people, she means for Edith. So I do it for Edith, you know? That's my campaign Should- slogan. Do it for Edith. <laughs> Wait, it's my campaign slogan. More f- things for me. <laughs> no, I guess like I'm being selfish for you in this case. Like you're just like do okay. it for the people, but I'm over here like do it for Edith. So okay, that's well, good. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> well, I guess my closing thoughts would be that it just it, it's a relationship, no matter what way you interpret it, that had like such great potential to have a long and lasting and meaningful impact not just in the first two seasons but throughout the series and it just really falls short and I think it's just so unfortunate that we just never get to see it develop in the way that I truly think would have been I mean really monumental to see yeah yes yeah and I also love them so much yes we both agree on that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for listening to us ramble on about Morgwen and our incoherent, messy thoughts <laughs> on Morgana <laughs> and Gwen. Yeah, if you have any comments or questions about this episode, 
please send them to mythsandmagicfancast at gmail.com or mythsandmagicfancast on Tumblr. Uh, if you would like to donate to our uh, website hosting fees, since we are poor uni students, you may check us out on mythsandmagicfancast on Kofi, link on the blog. And yeah, I guess all I have to say before we bid you farewell is uh, that none of you mentioned Lancelot Camelot, so I will do it now so we can keep the tradition going. Thank you. Um, maybe Gwen and Morgana go on a date to a Lancelot Camelot concert. There we go. <laughs> We've shoehorned him in again. Yes. And approved. that's it for this week, guys. <laughs> Stay safe out there. Have a nice month. I'll see you later. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Myths and Magic, a Merlin fan cast. The intro and outro music are snippets from the song Now We Ride by Alexander Nakarada, accompanied by dialogue from BBC's Merlin. More information can be found in the description. We will be dropping new episodes of the podcast twice a month. We hope you'll join us again soon.